Hey church family, we want to take a minute to just thank you for supporting all of our Sent to Serve September Sundays. We hope you enjoy the speakers and you are motivated now to carry the gospel of Christ with you no matter where you go and to help carry it into the world. As you can see, we are really close to meeting our world missions offering goal of $20,000. We just have room for five more windows over here, $500 each before we meet that goal. And since we're so close, we're going to leave our world missions offering open for a few more weeks in hopes that we will meet that goal. So if you still want to give, there is still time. Be encouraged to take the gospel with you no matter where you go. Upperclassmen, we have a great event coming up for you. It's going to be next Tuesday, October the 3rd, starting at 1130. There's going to be an Upperclassmen game day. Now, this is going to be directly after the Upperclassmen Tuesday Bible study that we have in the Fellowship Hall that starts at 1030. And so we're going to move on up after that's done to the hangar and have a great time of uh, some food fellowship and some games up at the hangar. And so we want to encourage you to be there for that next Tuesday, October the 3rd, starting at 1130. You can sign up at the Connections table and we'll see you there. With the end of the year rapidly approaching and our church calendar quickly filling up, I just wanted to give you guys a quick reminder about our event request form. If you have anything you'd like to do between now and the end of the year here on campus, it's important for you to fill that out. You can get there on our website from the news tab, follow that, click on the event request form, or you can fill it out from the app. So if you have anything coming up with a grow group or a ministry or discipleship group that you'd like to host here on campus, it's important to go ahead and fill out that event request form so we can get it approved so you can have your events here on campus. Thanks, guys. Church, let's stand and worship. We're singing to the Most High this morning. He alone is worthy. Put aside anything that may have happened in your week, in your day, and let's focus on Him this morning. Sing, There's Peace. There's peace that outlasts darkness and hope that's in the blood. There's future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow, for tomorrow's in your hands. And all I need you will provide, just like you always have. Oh, sing it, church. That I'm fighting a battle You've already won No matter what comes my way I will overcome Don't know what you're doing But I know what you've done Yes, we do So I'm fighting of his big come on sing there's mercy there's mercy in the waiting yes man up for today and when it's gone i know you're not for you are my hope and stay sing this out when the sea is raging your spirit
but that's under his power under his spirit under his anointing not of our own accord come on sing this out I know how the story ends I know how the story ends we will be with you again we know how it ends you're my savior confidence this morning church I know how the story is he's told us we will be with you again you're my savior you're my savior my defense he's not giving us a spirit of fear no more it with victory this morning. if we ever forget what he's delivered us from what he's delivered us to 
the price that he paid at Calvary Church. Don't get over that. Don't overlook that this morning.
worship Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old It shall not kneel, shall not faint By His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected to be praised. Lord, you deserve to be exalted in our lives, in our church, in our schools, in our businesses. Father, great is your faithfulness. Father, forgive us when we overlook who you are, when we overlook your consistency, when we overlook that you are unchanging, or that you are anything less than perfect. Father, it doesn't matter what we've been through this week. It doesn't matter what we're heading to next week. Lord, your nature is faithfulness. So, Father, come what may, we know that you are faithful and you are good and anything that you allow is for our good and for your glory. Father, we thank you for this time. We can cry out to you in song. Lord, now I pray that you would speak to us, challenge us, step on our toes, change us through your word. Father, we pray in this place today that hearts of stone would turn to hearts of flesh and Lord that you would be exalted and that someone that doesn't know you would leave here knowing you leave here knowing that they've had an encounter with almighty God leave here knowing that your spirit resides in them Father we pray that you'd fill us all right now with your spirit that you'd speak through our pastor that you'd speak through your word Lord you are great we love you Lord in Jesus name I pray Amen 
take your Bibles and turn to the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah, not Zechariah, not Zacchaeus, not Zorro, Zephaniah. It's right after the book of Habakkuk. If you've got a really good Bible, it's on page 1455. Um, <clears throat> this is one of those true indicators that uh, we follow our policy, which is to preach the messages that God has laid out. Uh, I don't try to finagle with the calendar. I don't try to monkey around with what God is doing. So we work through books. That's what we do. We've been working through the minor prophets. It seems like since um, Grayson was in middle school, um, I mean, quite that long, but it seems like it. So today we're going to begin. At, we've, we've had a great month of September. We've focused on missions. Uh, you guys have been faithful to give and to come, and we've had great speakers and great messages and have been fired up and encouraged. And so today we're going to talk all day long about wrath. I knew that would fire you up as much as it did me when I saw that that was where we were going to be today. I'm like, all right, Lord, you got a sense of humor. Uh, we've been doing this Mission 168, encouraging people to invite folks to church. And so if you're a first-time guest here today, welcome to the wrath. <laughs> um, this is a two-part message, to be fair. Uh, and I did not want to just do wrath all one whole message, but... Here's all kidding aside, here's what we have to do. We have to understand the wrath of God so that we can understand fully the rescue and the rule of God. That's the message title, Wrath, Rescue, and Rule. It's not, it's not catchy, it's not hip. Those are the three points. In two messages, we're going to talk about the wrath of God, the rule of God, the rescue of God, and we're going to do it all from Zephaniah. But today, we've got to go into Zephaniah 1, and we've got to look at the wrath of God. Now, before we get into the, the wrath, before we get into the book, I have a tri kind of a trivia question for you. What do the movies, Star Wars, and by the way, I know there's 50, 11 of them, Star Wars, the, the original, Star Wars, A New Hope is what they call it now. I'm, I'm old, so it was just plain old Star Wars when it came out. Star Wars, It's a Wonderful Life, The Shining, Home Alone, and The Lion King. Now that is a hodgepodge of movies. What do those movies have in common? Anybody know? Hopefully not, because if you do, you watch way too many movies. You need to like take a break, read a book, like do a Bible study, okay? You'll be okay. Here's what they have in common. Now anybody who's ever, who ever served on a worship team with me watching me walk to the piano is now terrified about what's about to happen. Here, here is what they have in common, okay? You ready? Sound familiar? All right. Really, most of the time you're going to hear this. All right, you're going to hear those four notes. There's a dissonance to those notes. There's, it does something inside of our psyche. Those notes, those four notes, you're going to find those in, and by the way, I'll, I'll try to remember to share the link tomorrow. I found a great article on this. But those movies, Star Wars, It's a Wonderful Life, The Shining, Home Alone, The Lion King, all have that, those four notes. It's called Dies Irae. And it's a Gregorian chant. It became a hymn uh, years, and years 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 ago. Uh, we don't have a lot of worship songs nowadays about the wrath of God, you know. I, I don't know that Hillsong or Vertical or whatever is going to come out with a new hit single called, you know, The Day of the Lord, The Day of Wrath. Um, it's, just, it's just hard to sing about. <laughs> I know nothing would have blessed you more than to show up this morning, welcome, everybody stand, let's sing, The Wrath of God. <laughs> Doesn't make for a real warm and fuzzy uh, song, but if you listen for those notes, you'll find them in a lot of uh, musical scores for movies. Uh, the main focus of this book is that day. It's Dies Irae, literally the day of wrath. It is the day of the Lord, the day that we will stand in judgment and God will judge the world for the sinfulness of it. Just as a reminder, God is righteous and just and holy and he must punish, he must destroy unrighteousness. It's not that he has some angle, he's, it's not that he's got some grudge against you. Because he is holy and just and righteous, he's perfectly all of those things, he also has to be wrath and vengeance against those things that are not righteous. 
So the book begins, and if you have your Bible, look with me in verse 1. It begins, chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah. Now, flip all the way to the end. We're going to do what most of you, if you're like me, probably did to books that you were supposed to read for class when you were in high school. We're going to flip to the last page. Look at verse 20, the last sentence in verse 20 of chapter 3. It says, the Lord has spoken. And, and so I want to be clear. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah opens the book and the Lord has spoken, closes the book. This is clearly God leaving no stone unturned, no doubt in our mind that his intention is to communicate this message through the prophet exactly how he had dictated it. This is not the prophet's own clever, witty phrases and ideas and thoughts. This is not some uh, literary work that he went into trying to capture the imagination. He is essentially a court reporter. Okay, He's essentially a stenographer. God recites the message and he writes it down. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the Lord has spoken. Now, this message was likely preached prior to the religious awakening of 622 B.C., during King Josiah's reign, they were doing some house cleaning and there had been wicked kings before him and it was really like everything had gone pretty south. And so they're cleaning out some stuff and I, I don't remember exactly the, the, the methodology, but they found the book of the law. It had been like squirreled away somewhere like behind a wall and they found it and they brought it to the king and the king was like, wow. And they started to read it, and the Word of God has power. And so when they read it, there was this great religious awakening. They restored the temple. They restored worship. He was a good king, and he led well. You can see his story in 2 Chronicles 34. But, but we, we believe, we're, I'm confident, that Ze Zephaniah's message was before that because we don't see any mention in his book, uh, in his, his prophecy of the day of the Lord. He doesn't mention this religious awakening. Now, here's what I believe. I believe that it was God preparing the people for what he knew was about to happen. He knew they were about to have a religious revival. They were about to have an awakening. And so what do you need before you get a religious re revival? What do you... No, no, no. I'm not talking... No, listen. It'd be really easy for us to sit here this morning and think about Judah and Jerusalem and Israel and all those people and go, yeah, that's for them. That's not for us. I'm asking you this morning in 2023 at West Mobile Baptist Church, before you have a religious awakening, before you have a revival of your faith in Christ, what do you need? I believe that you need this message today. I believe that we all need to understand fully the wrath of God so that we can have that religious revival, that, that spiritual awakening, so that we can better understand the rescue and the rule of God. If you don't understand His wrath, you don't understand what you need to be rescued from. And if you don't understand the wrath and the rescue, how can you appreciate His rule? So to prepare them for this coming revival, and by the way, my prayer today is that God would use this message, this minor prophet, to speak that message into your heart through His Holy Spirit, through His Holy Word, through His flawed messenger, so that you too would be able to enter a time of revival, of spiritual reawakening. He's going to pour His wrath out on those who choose to be His enemies, both in Jerusalem and Judah and also to the world one day. Those of you that have been around a while, this is going to terrify you almost as much as me playing the piano terrified our worship team. I have one point today. I was told during the break that uh, uh, Ron Hinton, who was in seminary, he said, my professor told me you can't preach a message with one point. I said, I may prove him right today. <laughs> Nevertheless, we have one point. So if you would, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word today, okay? God, we, we, uh, we come to you this morning. We just ask that you would speak. Uh, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross, that you would... Allow me to decrease and you to increase. Um, God, this message is not about me. Uh, it is to me. First and foremost, this is a message to me so I can understand your wrath, so that I can understand your love more, more fully. God, through me as I try to be a mouthpiece for you. And God, help us to hear your voice this morning. Help us to, to sense where you're leading us and how you want us to respond. And we will give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen. So, Again, the major theme of the book is the justice of God exacted against Judah as an intermediate judgment, followed by the greater fulfillment that we will see one day 
in the day of the Lord when God will judge the nations and initiate his eternal and perfect kingdom. Again, Joel 3 uh, is a really good place to see this. Joel 3 really camps out on this concept of the day of the Lord and speaks to it. But, but here we see kind of a break. There, there's two pieces of this first chapter, uh, verses 2 and 3. Let's, let's read those together. He says, I will completely sweep away everything from the face of the earth. This is the Lord's declaration. I will sweep away people and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, and the ruins along with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth. This is the Lord's declaration. Now, what he is doing here is he is speaking specifically about the eventual day of the Lord. He is casting our eyes forward in time. We don't know when it's going to happen. But can I just give you a piece of wisdom this morning? It's definitely nearer now than when this book was written in the, in the 7th century B.C. We are closer today to seeing the eventuality that he speaks about here of the day of the Lord coming to pass. And then if you pick it up in verse 4 and read through the third verse of chapter 2, there, there he is speaking specifically of the destruction of Jerusalem, the coming punishment upon Jerusalem by the Babylonians. We know that now. Uh, he doesn't specify that explicitly here. But he is speaking to two different days of the Lord. The day of, think of it this way. The day of the Lord, all caps, in the, the eventual, and the day of the Lord that was a wrath being poured out, a punishment being poured out on Jerusalem for what they had done and how they had drifted from God in the nearer future for them. The word of the Lord comes to Zephaniah. It's not his own mental or emotional construction. And then it comes out just throwing bombs. I mean, just haymakers. Look at what he says. I will completely sweep away everything from the face of the earth. Now listen, if all I ever do is come up here and preach messages, and the very first thing I say is, hey, good morning, welcome, I will sweep away everything off the face of the earth, you're going to know two things. Number one, I'm not, oh, I almost said the name. <laughs> I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. I almost said the name, and I don't want to say the name, hurt nobody's feelings up here. I'm going to leave it alone. But number two, you would know that I wasn't messing around. And so God comes out with this message through the prophet, and he says, I will completely sweep away everything from the earth. Now, it's, it's incredibly interesting to me the methodology that he lays out. So watch what he does. Pay attention to the order. He says, I will sweep away people and animals and birds and fish. So he gives you four things he's going to sweep away in that order, okay? People, animals, birds, fish. If you will go back and look at Genesis chapter 1 on days 5 and 6 of creation, watch the order of creation. On day 5 and 6, he creates fish, birds, animals, and people. This is like an undoing of the creation. God creates in this order, fish, birds, animal, people. God says, I'm going to wipe away everything from the face of the earth in this order, people, animals, birds, fish. He's going to obliterate the earth. And he uses this phrase completely from the face of the earth. That is exactly how he uses the same terminology in Genesis chapter 6, verse 7, when he's bringing the floodwaters. Watch what he says. I will wipe mankind who I created off the face of the earth of the earth, together with animals, creatures that crawl, and birds of the sky. God is saying in creation, this is the order. He is now saying through Zephaniah, I'm going to undo the creation. I'm going to uncreate. I'm going to wipe away everything that I've created. Why? Because it is infected. It is polluted with sin. You may not be that worried about infection. We've been through like all the scare tactics. And remember back in 2020 when we thought that if we walked outside and breathed in a coronavirus, we would just drop dead? It would just, we, it, you, you know, like, no way, you just, <laughs> you just dead. And then we learned more about it. We found out some more things and we got some vaccines, we got some treatments, and, and the virus weakened a little bit. And now, even though we're still, which we should be cautious about it, we don't like, we're not living in terror. We thought it was Ebola in 2020. Like, you, you just take one breath and just <laughs> kill over. So, so and, and listen, I'm not making light of the fact we lost loved ones. We lost dear people. What I'm saying is we learned a lot more about it over the years. This, is, this should catch our attention. 
When God says, I'm going to uncreate, it shows how seriously He takes the pollution of sin. We may not see it that way. We may not take it that seriously. I think we do. If, if I had a bowl up here of M&M's, okay, just a bowl of M&M's, and I told you here, you can have all the M&M's you want, but one of them is actually a rabbit pellet. You know what rabbits do when they, anyway. Lettuce will do that to you. So anyway, we, we took one of those and we put a candy coating on it, and it's in there with the M&M's. How many of y'all want to get you a big handful of M&M's? We should take sin's pollution in our lives just that serious. If you wouldn't want to look, if, if, I had a, if I had a pitcher of drinking water we just got out of the filter and I dropped one ounce of sewage in there, you would not want to drink. So why are we comfortable having, so listen, why are we comfortable allowing sin in our lives and we expect to come into the presence of a holy God? God takes sin seriously so should we. He doesn't just stop with the people and the animals. He says this. I love the way he says this. And the ruins along with the wicked. That word ruins is, is kind of odd. It's a weird... What, what is he talking about? My Bible says, has a little note there, uh, objects connected with idolatry. The literal translation of that word ruins in the Hebrew is a stumbling block or an idol. So here's what God says in verse 2. I will sweep away all these things and the ruins along with the wicked. What he's saying is, I'm going to wipe away all these fake gods and everybody that worships them. You may not think that's a big deal because you don't worship the fake gods that they worship. Stay with me. What he's saying really is, there is no space in our worship of God for God and worship. There, there's no space in the life of a true follower of Jesus for a God and worship. What is a God and worship? Well, I like to go to church and worship the Lord, but I still like to go get my drink on on Friday and Saturday night. I, I, I like to worship. I like worship songs on the radio, but you know, I also like to dabble over here in some of this stuff. I, I like this. I like that. I want to take a little piece. We, we take the Word of God and we just cut it all up so it's not offensive. Well, well, I don't like that verse, so I'm just going to ignore that verse. Uh, my former pastor, one of my dearest friends, uh, James Pickering, uh, Brother James talked about a sermon that he heard at a revival many, many, many years ago. He said this old preacher got up and he, he had this, uh, this old book. It looked like a Bible. And he gets up and he starts to read. He reads a, a kind of a passage that makes people uncomfortable, maybe Romans 1. He reads somewhere. He's like, you know what? That makes people uncomfortable. And he rips the page out and throws it down. And then he flips over to some other plant, and he starts reading these passages. Well, that hurts people's feelings. That's a little offensive. He pulls it out. He, he reads it. Oh, that's insensitive. He, he pulls that paper. And when he finally finishes, he has one page left in this book. And he looks at it, and he says, oh, look at there, one page left. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And here's what he said. He said, here's the, here's the secret. If you don't believe any of that stuff out there, and he tears that last page out, he said, you can't believe that either. That's how we should treat the Word of God. It's not always popular. It's not always comfortable. Look at me. It's always the truth. It is always the rule, the regulation, the responsibility for us to live as Christ. So, so what about those gods? Baal was the fertility god of the Canaanites. Remember them? Uh, God booted them out of their land and gave it as the promised land to the children of Israel after their exodus. Uh, Molech was the sun god of the Amorites, and he was associated with child sacrifice. Uh, was also with astrology and temple prostitutes. Let me give you, do we have those on the screen? Uh, let me give you some verses. Uh, Numbers 25, there we go, we got them up there. Numbers 25, Judges 2, 2 Kings 17, Jeremiah 11, Hosea 2. These are all places where God comes out against these gods of Baal and Molech. Well, well, here's what you're probably sitting there thinking. Well, man, I'm good, preacher. I don't worship Baal. I don't worship Molech. I, I don't worship those false gods. We still worship those gods today. We just don't call them by their given name. When you consider the prevalence in our culture of pornography, by the way, it is one of the most serious addiction problems we have in our country today. We have worldwide today. By the way, do you realize that pornography is the reason we have so many child abductions and, and, and uh, uh, you know, people being pulled out of their cars and, and people disappearing and, and being sold into sex, sex slavery? There's sex trafficking is a terrible blight upon society. 
most of that comes from pornography. Pornography, like every other addiction, always overpromises and underdelivers. The first time you see it, it, you get those dopamine hits, and the next time you see it, you got to see something more or something worse or something just weirder, just like drugs. You, I have a, a, one of my good friends. We've talked about him often. He's sitting in jail right now for the rest of his natural life because he murdered three people. You know where it started? He had an injury, he had a surgery, and he had a pill. Oxycontin went into his body. He told me in the Bay County Jail, he said, man, the first, for the first time that pill hit my stomach, I was done. It always overpromises. It always underdelivers. It always leaves you wanting more. When you look at the, the fixation that we have as a nation of sex outside of marriage, the, the covenant relationship between a male and a female, a man and a woman, that God laid out in Genesis, that Jesus reaffirmed in the Gospels, is the only place that sexual activity should happen. And if you get outside of that, it is sin. Not just homosexual, not just transgender, not any of that. If you have sex outside of a covenant marriage between a man and a woman, with God in the center of it, it is sinful. Amen. And we are, we are fixated on it as a culture. That's Baal. We don't call it Baal, but it's Baal. And what about Moloch? Look at the things he's associated with. Child sacrifice. Hello? We have people beating themselves to death to try to get it where you could kill a child up to the moment that it's born. And by the way, we have other people who go one step further and say, even if it's born, you can't give it life-saving measures if the mother doesn't want it. That's Moloch. That is child sacrifice. No, we're not putting a child in the fire to offer it to this God. We are offering this child to the God of self-sufficiency. We're offering this God to the to the or this this child to the God of uh, well I don't feel like it or I, it's not my problem or not my fault. We are still pushing Moloch. We even have people who still delve and dabble into astrology. Oh well, I'm a Pisces, so that's why I did that. I'm a Pisces. Oh well, you're a Sagittarius. You're a Sagittarius. My nephew's a Sagittarius. If you wake up every morning and you read your horoscope, by the way, I couldn't remember the word this morning in first service. They told me horoscope, but everybody said it at a different time, so it sounded like this. <laughs> that was not helpful. And then finally somebody said, horoscope, gotcha. Okay, I heard it. If you wake up every day and read your horoscope, read the shampoo bottle in the, in the shower. <laughs> it's just as effective. At least you learn something. Rinse, lather, repeat. Some of you are blind. I'm not sure how you got out of the shower this morning. You just kept reading it and kept doing it. I've been in here for 45 minutes. I'm almost out of shampoo, but I keep rinsing, lathering, and repeating. <laughs> Sorry. I can make blind jokes. I am one. But we dabble off into some of this stuff. Listen, that is God and. Yeah, oh, I love Jesus, and I love to sing the songs, and I love to worship and raise my hands, but I still believe that I'm a Virgo, and so I have to think about the moons and the Jupiter and the linemen and all that. No, that's God and worship. You are still worshiping Molech even if you don't understand it. The problem was here that the people had made a commitment to God and they were not living up to it. By the way, Joshua 24, I'm not going to read this whole chapter. I know I give you a lot of verses. I'm trying to help you. I'm not trying to be like, just give you a bunch of homework. I'm not a teacher. Uh, I hated homework then. I, I hate homework now. I'm not giving you homework. What I'm telling you is if you want to fully understand Zephaniah, you need to go read some of these other texts. It will be very helpful for you to read Joel 3. It won't kill you. Again, you're not reading your horoscope. Read Joel 3. Read Joshua 24. We're going to pick up in verse 16. We're going to bounce a little bit, but just stay with me here. Joshua 24, 16. The people replied, we will certainly not abandon the Lord to worship other gods. Joshua is giving them this kind of like challenge of who are you going to be. Verse 19, Joshua told him, You will not be able to worship the Lord because he's a holy God. If you abandon the Lord and worship foreign gods, he will turn against you, harm you, and completely destroy you after he has been good to you. In other words, if you're going to be uh, the kind of person who would take God's goodness and then throw it in his face and worship other gods, he's not going to stand for that. And so here's their answer. No! That's what they said. No, we will not worship other gods. We will worship the Lord. Look at verse 22. Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you yourselves have chosen to worship the Lord. If you have joined Westmobile Baptist Church, 
you are a witness against yourself. You, church membership does not save you, but you're saying, hey, those are my people. I'm part of that family. I, 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 I serve the Lord together with gladness with those people. I am in the family of God that meets at West Mobile Baptist Church. And if you go out and live like the devil, you are a witness against yourself that you are a false convert. The, the, I'm not going to get into it today, but in a couple of weeks I'll give you some of these. In 1 John, 1 John makes it very clear. You cannot continue in sin and love Christ. It doesn't say that you can't sin. We all make mistakes. We're all wearing this flesh robe. We mess up. Give me a minute. I might mess up before you leave today. If I have to drive on Airport Boulevard, I guarantee you I'm probably going to mess up. We mess up, but we don't continue in it. We repent of it. We ask God to help us and change us. And if you're not doing that, you're a witness against yourself. You can, you can give Jesus lip service all you want to. How you live is what you believe. And that's what he told them then. That's what he's telling us now. And he tells them here, he said, look, I'm going to cut off mankind. That word in the Hebrew is karath. And it means to destroy or to consume. It's the same word to describe circumcision in Exodus 4.25. That's how God wants to cut them off, discard them, destroy them, get rid of them. He's not messing around. I want you to hear me today, church. He ain't messing around in 2023. You think God needs to evolve? You need to check yourself. God is a creator. God is a sustainer. God is the end all be all. He does not need to lighten up. He does not need to loosen up. He does not need to get with the times. We need to come under the Lordship of Christ and we need to serve Him with gladness. Worshiping on the rooftops is mentioned here. That's just another way to talk about idol worship. It was condemned all over the Old Testament. And then he gets to verse 6. And he says, uh, he's talking about those who he's going to stretch his hand out against. And he says, and those who turn back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Again, in two weeks, we're going to get to that Lord willing. But he's basically saying there are two types of false believers. Those who have openly rejected the Lord that they once claimed to follow. Now, in our context, it would be those who have deconstructed, those who claim to have a faith and then have walked away. I would recommend the opposite. I, I claim to have a false faith and I recognized it was false and I came to Christ. So that's one group, those who have openly rejected. And then those who have inwardly rejected. They claim to serve the Lord, but they don't seek Him. That may be some of you. Preacher, I'll say when I was five years old, I walked the aisle at vacation Bible school and shook the preacher's hand. I got a baptismal certificate. And I've been a church member since I was five years old. How's your relationship with Jesus, though? Well, 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 I bring my Bible to church on Sunday. Not what I asked you. Well, I'm a good person. Thoughts. Jesus said there's none good. How's your relationship with the Lord? Maybe you have outwardly, you're still doing the stuff, but inwardly you have rejected Him because you're not seeking Him. Again, we'll look at that more in a couple weeks. Look at verses 7 through 9. He tells them to be silent in the presence of the Lord. You, you see that a lot of places in Scripture. He says, uh, For the day of the Lord is near. The, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated His guests. They would be very familiar because the Jewish people were constantly doing sacrifices. Uh, they had a ton of different, the festival of weeks and the, the, the Passover and Pentecost, and they had all these different things and, and all these different recognitions and sacrifices and and. and so they would, they would hear this language and they would know exactly what he was talking about. The, the problem here is they were going from being the guests at the feast to being the main course. That's really what he's telling them here. He's like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite the Babylonians in. They didn't know that then, but that's who he was bringing in. You say you're ready for the feast? <laughs> you, got a, you got an apple in your mouth? Y'all seen those pigs where they put the apple in their mouth and they lay them out? That's what he's saying. I'm not preparing a feast for you. I'm preparing you as a feast because of your disobedience. And so that's the shocking picture of what he's saying. That's why the prophet tells them to hush. These events are coming soon. You need to contemplate what I'm talking about, what this prophecy means. Just like with our salvation, God had done all the work. He had prepared the sacrifice. He had consecrated the guests. And he's telling them now, you need to hush and get ready for what's about to happen. This same concept of, of silence in the awesome presence of God is also mentioned in Amos 8.3 and Habakkuk 2.20. The principle here is that when we are sinful and we come into the presence of His righteousness, it should shut us up. 
Have any of y'all thought or said this maybe in the past? I have, so we, we can all, like, I've been stupid too. It's okay. Where we say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this. And, and by the way, just my person, it's usually something. Hey, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God something. I'm gonna, I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask God, why did he do this and what happened to this? Let me tell you what you're going to do when you get to heaven. You're going to fall on your face. And you're going to worship the holy God that has redeemed you and saved you and protected you from his wrath. Verse 8 talks about how the judgment is going to come to the rulers who failed to model the proper attitude of worship. And it's going to come down to the, the, the ones, the pagan neighbors that they dealt with. Verse 12 has an interesting statement. It may, may kind of slip by us. It says, um, hang on, let me find it. It says, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. I will search Jerusalem. This is really simple to understand. If, if it's dark outside and it's nighttime and you've lost your car, you probably don't need a flashlight, Right? I think I can find a car. I mean, it's going to have to be like eclipse dark for me not to be able to find a car. It might take me a minute in the parking lot, but I'm going to find it. What if you lost your car key? Searching is going to be a little bit more like you're going to have to really be careful. What he's saying is, I'm going to search with lamps. In other words, I'm turning on my flashlight and I'm looking everywhere over. Nobody's going to be able to hide. You're not going to be able to hide out and miss the wrath that's coming just because you think you can get away with it. The people are saying this too in the, at the end of verse 12. Uh, it says, people who say to themselves, the Lord will, do, uh, will not do good or evil. What, he, what they're basically saying is the Lord will do nothing. They're going, I'm not worried about him. I'm going to be honest with you. I have some respect for people who are just openly anti-God. I have more respect for those who will submit to the Lordship of Christ. I have no respect for people who go, nah. Nah, I can go either way. God's not going to do anything. God's not about, you know, like I'm not scared of him. I'm not worried about him. We act like God is irrelevant. That's what our culture has been doing now for my whole life and before even, but it's more obvious as we go. God is the most relevant entity in the universe because he is the creator and sustainer of everything else. If you put anything else before God as far as relevance, you are clueless. And this is a deeper indication of the cluelessness and lostness of mankind when he says there are people saying God won't do anything good or bad. God is irrelevant. By saying that he's searching Jerusalem, even these irrelevant people are not going to be able to hide out. I think sometimes people in our culture act like little bitty kids playing hide and seek. Who else had played hide and seek with like a toddler? How do they hide? They figure if they can't see you, you can't see them. Let me tell you something. We act like that with God. We act like if we don't look at him, he can't see us. I'm here to break that, that myth. That's not how that works. God sees everything. In verses 14 through 18, he gives us these powerful uh, little snippets. Uh, it's verse 15, a day of trouble and distress, destruction and desolation, darkness and gloom, clouds and total darkness. He talks about a trumpet blast, a battle cry. All of these things are little bitty just chunks of vivid descriptions of what the day of the Lord is going to look like. He says it's going to be a very dark day. I think that is both figuratively and literally and honestly, the darkness, the literal darkness is a gift from God because you're not going to want to see what the wrath of God looks like being poured out. It will be a dark day, figuratively and literally. In verse 18, since wealth was, is, and always will be an easy God to worship, he calls it out. Look what he says. Their silver and their gold will be unable to rescue them on the day of the Lord's wrath. The whole earth will be consumed by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make a complete, yes, a horrifying end of all the inhabitants of the earth. Ezekiel echoes this in Ezekiel 7, 19. Their silver and gold will be unable to save them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Jesus said it this way, Matthew 19, 23 and 24. Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Why is that? Why is it so difficult? Is money sinful? No. Matter of fact, I, I hope we can find 
some folks who will give a little bit more to our missions offering and reach our goal. That money is going to be used for the kingdom. When you give to the church, we use that money. We put that money to good use. We, we get the gospel as it is to people as they are, and that costs money. So money's not evil. But you know what I have found true of everyone that I've ever met that had a lot of money? You know what they all wanted? More. Just like the other false idols that I talked about before, just like the other addictions that I mentioned before, my dad took his first drink at like 12 years old. I'm sure he didn't toast to here's dying at a young age of a horrible death and not been able to know my grandchildren. But you see, addiction, false idols, they're all the same. They all offer something that they over-offer and they can't deliver. And money's the same way. Hey, man, if you'll just get a little bit more money, just get a little bit more, it'll make everything better. You know what you should do? You should cut some corners. Don't give to the church. Just cut some corners. You need to get. You need to pad that wallet, man. Your 401k is suffering. You need to get some more money in there. You need to try to get out and earn, son. You need to get your little side hustle. You need to work on this, work on that. Next thing you know, your, your family doesn't know what you look like because you're never there. You're always out trying to get another dollar. Next thing you know, you're cutting corners and cheating people and, and mistreating people for the love of money. The Bible calls it the root of all kinds of evil. It is, it is a, a, and it's an addiction. And is it a, it's a false idol that comes into your life and takes over. And so he's saying even these people that think their wealth is going to protect them, <laughs> God don't take checks on Judgment Day. God don't take Venmo on Judgment Day. When the day of the Lord happens, it ain't going to matter what your bank account looks like. We're all going to stand in judgment before a holy God. So again, we're, we're going to look at the other two parts of the message next week, and I hope that will be a little bit more cheerful. But I, listen, I refuse to tap dance around what the Word of God says. <clears throat> I'm not going to do it. He asks one major question. Now, he doesn't ask it in the form of a question, but he really asks this question, where will you find shelter on Judgment Day? Look at Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. I always wait until I hear a few Bibles zip, <laughs> and there's some evil side of me that goes, now go read this verse. I'll read it for you. Zephaniah 2, 3. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth, who carry out what He commands. He says, seek righteousness. He doesn't say seek your own way or your own comfort. He says, seek righteousness. Who, who is the embodiment of righteousness? That'd be Jesus. He says, seek humility. He doesn't say seek a acclaim, fame, notoriety. He says, seek humility. Who is the embodiment of humility? Jesus. Having considered equality with God, not something to be used for his own benefit, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Then he says this, perhaps you will be concealed on the day of the Lord's anger. You and I have no righteousness to bring. God said he made him that knew no sin become sin so that we might what? Become the righteousness of God. You want to find shelter on judgment day? His name is Jesus. You want to find peace in the midst of this crazy world we live in? His name is Jesus. You're struggling to find hope in the midst of all the chaos that we see today? His name is Jesus. If we, need, if we want to be concealed on the day of judgment, the day of wrath, the great and terrible day of the Lord, that concealment is only found in Christ. So two questions, and we'll close with this. Number one, are you doing that? Are you seeking Christ? Are you, have you surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? We always say it that way here because I get, I get, a, little, I get a little cringy when I hear, and I'm not being ugly, but ask Jesus into your heart. Okay, if you're... Sometimes little kids have trouble understanding everything. That's okay. But we need to understand it fully as we get older that we are not, we are not just giving Jesus an apartment to live in. Make Jesus Lord. <laughs> hey, chief, you ain't got that kind of authority. He is Lord. You don't make him Lord. You can recognize his Lordship. You can submit to his Lordship. You do not give him Lordship. It is important for us to understand our position. We are in Christ. That means we are surrendered to Christ. We are submitted to Christ. We are obedient to Christ. We serve Christ. We follow Christ. We emit. We radiate.
Christ. And if you do that, then you, you have found concealment. Now here's the last question. Do you know that you'll be safe when his judgment comes? This is not a possibility. It's an inevitability. The Bible talks about it in many places that there will be a day of judgment. It talks about it in the Old Testament. Jesus spent some time talking about it. We need to understand that it is inevitable that we will all one day have to give an account. Your mom and dad and grandpa and all of them are not going to stand up for you. All of us are going to have to stand before God and give an account. And you were either a wheat or a tear. You're a sheep or you're a goat. You're saved or you're lost. You are a child of God or you're an enemy of God. I don't like talking about wrath. But man, when you understand his wrath, it really helps you understand how great a love he had for us, that he would come to this earth, live a sinless life, die a sacrificial death, be buried in a borrowed tomb, raised on the third day, rise to the level of where God is, seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting to come back and get us. If you don't understand his wrath, you can't appreciate his mercy. Would you stand with me? I know it's, <clears throat> it's maybe not... Uh, culturally appropriate to speak of God's wrath. I think we're in a day and age when most people don't want to talk about that. They want a, a hippie Jesus. They want a Harry Krishna Jesus who comes to the airport, hands out flowers, and has peace, love, and happiness for everybody, no matter what you believe and no matter how you live. That's just simply not the Jesus of the Bible. So the simple invitation today is, do you know Christ? And again, I'm not asking about something you've done in the past. I'm talking about how your relationship with Christ is, is today. Have you surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Are you following Him with everything that you have? Is, is your life's mission to make sure that He is pleased with how you live your life? If you're here today without Christ, you can come and make a profession of faith. We would love to pray with you and help disciple you, show you what it means to live for Christ. Maybe you hear like one of the folks that came forward this morning in the first service who said, I've made a profession of faith as a young boy, but I've strayed away from Jesus. I'm not living for him. I want to rededicate my life. I want to serve him fully the rest of my days. Maybe you have recognized this morning during this message that you're worshiping one of those false gods. You've, you've, you've turned from a Christ worship to a God and worship. If you want to rededicate your life, you can do that today. If you need to join our church, move the letter. All of those things are perfectly fine during the invitation time, but specifically today, do you know that you will have concealment on the day of judgment? Do you know that you will be sheltered in Christ when the wrath of God is poured out? Don't leave here without ask, having that question answered in your heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to preach from your inerrant, infallible, inspired, all-sufficient word. I pray, God, that nothing that I've said has been my opinion, but it's all been your truth. I pray, God, you would take that truth, you would multiply, multiply that truth in the hearts of the listeners. And God, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that has not settled their eternity, has not put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, I pray you would give them boldness today to come forward and confess Christ. God, for all of us, I pray that you would continue to, to weed out the things in our life that are not pleasing to you. Help us to be completely surrendered in every aspect of our lives. Father, work now in this invitation time as we briefly pause. Holy Spirit, have your way. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. If you need to make a decision, you come forward now.
church family, let me introduce you to Heather Buford. Gosh, it's amazing how quickly I can forget something. It really is. A, it's a special talent. Heather Buford. Uh, Heather is coming today. She uh, has a varied faith history, but she is coming today to settle that her faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. She is trusting him for her salvation, him alone, and she wants to be baptized and become a member of Westmobile Baptist Church. So how does that make you feel, church family? Michelle and Amelia have been pouring into her, and I know they're going to continue to do that and disciple her. Uh, we're excited to see how God's going to use you. Y'all go ahead and have a seat. And uh, Julie is going to get with you in just a minute. She's going to make sure we got all your information, okay? Uh, church family, thank you so much for being here today. Visitors, if you will, uh, we have an, uh, a Connect card. It's in the back of the seat there in front of you. You can fill that out, drop that in one of the offering boxes on your way out, or you can scan the QR code, click on that link, and it'll take you to a WooFu page. You can fill that in. Uh, we're not going to hassle you. We're not going to come, like, beat on your door. And uh, We just want to know if there's some way we can help minister to you, help uh, point you to Christ, help you grow in your relationship with Christ. We just want to be a, a blessing. Uh, but if you'd fill that out, we would appreciate it. Uh, church, thank you so much for the church work day yesterday. We had a bunch of people come out to all of those who came out and, and, uh, and ate good food and had great fellowship and did a bunch of work. Thank you. Uh, God has given us a great gift in our property and having you come out here and serve to help uh, improve some things is really a blessing. Our ditch project has been completed. They came and, and rolled the sod out yesterday, and so they're going to be watering it. Uh, but it looks a lot better that it's completed. Uh, should be everything should be gone in the next few days. Uh, thank you so much for your patience as we were going through that and kind of the, the growing pains of making some improvements. We appreciate that. Austin McNeil is our student pastor. Austin's going to come and close us with a word of prayer. One last thing, uh, two last things. Our missions giving, we are very close to reaching our goal. I pray that you guys would give. Maybe you're sitting here today and going, but Brother Kevin, I can't, I don't have that much money to give to make up the difference. Give what the Lord lays on your heart. Now, Jesus had a little boy come to him with, uh, with loaves and fishes, and he blessed it and fed 5,000. Trust me, God is not going to look down on your gift if you give it out of obedience. So you give as the Lord lays on your heart. Number two, if you're here today and you heard this message and you're, you're just not sure about your salvation, but you didn't want to come down forward. It's kind of freaky to walk down here in front of everybody. Heather's, maybe you're not as brave as Heather. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's tough. It's hard to do this. April and I will be at the back door or the front door. Don't, don't leave without talking to us. If you're not sure about your eternity, listen, eternity is too long to be wrong. Come out there and talk to us before you leave. We'd be glad to spend some time, pray with you, talk to you, help you in any way we can, okay? God bless you. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for giving us days like today when we can join together, Lord, and we can worship you through song and, and through your word. Lord, thank you for this reminder that you've given us today. Lord, I pray that we don't leave here hoping um, that maybe we're on the, on the right side of eternity, Lord. I pray we don't leave here without a knowledge and a pursuit of you, that we know what you have done for us, that we know what you have saved us from, and that we commit our lives to walk in pursuit of that. Lord, I, I pray that in that pursuit that we are lights for you in our communities, that as we leave here and go to the different places that will be school, work, wherever we may be. Lord, that we radiate a light that can only come from you. Lord, that we point people to you, that when people see us, they see you in us. So God, I pray that for this church, for everyone here today, that we walk out of here with a light that can only come from you. In Jesus' name I pray.